This video presentation is a little discussion on how panarchy theory might be useful to game B. Um, and it comes in two parts. First, we're going to look at um, some ideas that Hannah Arendt had on the human condition, the, basically the sum total of human action. And we're going to um, map that on to a notion of the collective human action, the sum total of collective human action, as if we were Martians looking down on humans as a species. That would be the first phase. Then we're going to look at panarchy theory, how it was developed by Buzz Hollings, and see if we can then map um, the, human, the model of human action onto the panarchy theory in a useful way. So um, hopefully you'll enjoy the video, and thanks for asking the question. So Hannah Arendt wrote a book called um, Human Action, and it was uh, the life, the life, um, hold on, Hannah Arendt wrote a book called The Human Condition. It was the first volume of a two-volume um, series she was working on. She never finished. She actually died before she wrote the second book. And the second book was The Life of the Mind. But in this first book, The Human Condition, she was looking at the life, the existential embodied life of humans from deep history into the modern times. And she starts with a division of, of human activity, of the human, an analysis of the human condition that came out of the early Greek times and um, their self-reflective process and their early philosophy. So it doesn't really matter if um, in terms of this presentation, if we th believe that these distinctions are somehow metaphysically or ontologically true, the important thing is this is how we have conceived of our human condition um, over a long period of time from very, very early times, so that it self-reflectively enacts the way we, um, we act in the world um, because we have this uh, native way of understanding our human condition through um, epochs in our evolution. And this is what the Greeks um, knew or discovered or observed about um, history of the human condition up until their time. So in her book, Hannah Arendt describes the three three domains of human activity. There's labor, there's work, and there's action. And what distinguishes these are several key features. So, first of all, they come into the human condition in time, so that um, labor is a more primitive or primordial capacity. Work comes, enters into the human condition a little later in time, and then quite much later, and this was the discovery or the invention of the Greeks, this domain of human action. Labor is the way that we take care of our existentially biological needs. Everybody is in a level playing field with respect to labor. Um, it's that we have to feed ourselves, we have to find shelter, we reproduce ourselves. And so, just like other animals, homo laborans is 
the aspect of the human condition which arises and falls from generation to generation. It doesn't change. Each generation has to feed itself. Each generation reproduces. Each generation dies. And so when we look at ourselves from the activity of labor, we imagine ourselves as all being equal at some very primordial biological level. It's kind of leveling the playing field. And this is what Marx, of course, talked about in terms of homo laborans, that an hour's worth of work is an hour's worth of work, that at this very, this is the activity of the commutas, the commutarian aspect of labor, um, that, that defines us as biological beings, biological animals. And of course, at some point in our time, with, especially with, uh, you know, as the Greeks understood, um, and as we look at the anthropological record, as we liberated human time and resources through labor, primarily by um, the free labor of women and slaves, then some men, and, and in this case they were men, um, began to cultivate a new type of human activity, which is we can just simply call work. And unlike labor, where it's all a commutarian kind of level playing field, work was the kind of activity that distinguished men. It distinguished the great rhetoricians, and it distinguished the poets, and it distinguished the architects who planned the monuments. So the, the men that were liberated into the capacity of work would direct the laboring masses to build the monuments. Um, so that um, we can see that becoming a sage or becoming a emperor was the type of um, skill that distinguished people's capacities and not this kind of skill that everybody just had in common. So that um, this new type of human activity um, became available because of the excess resource of time that was made possible by the great laboring uh, population. And so work, unlike labor, um, is not, um, the goal of work is not to just complete these cyclical, never-ending needs, but to create immortal projects that per persist across generations, that create these memories Across, across great swaths of time, these big projects. And then the um, third division that came later in our um, history that the Greeks actually invented was this notion of action. And action, the, the, um, the key feature of action are speech acts. So action um, was some kind of new way of um, understanding ourselves and our capacities. So action had to do with showing up in the marketplace, showing up in the palace as a free person and creating ideas and the creative exchange of ideas and the democratization of the self. So in some sense, similar to labor, it, it, it was extended to more and more the common person, um, and it was a capacity um, of free men, and eventually, you know, we, we see this, this capacity of human action growing into our, big, our great democracies today, but action was established on the fundamental principle of the free self. So you didn't have to be quite as rare a talent, you just had to show up as a self in the marketplace of ideas in the speech act. So actions was inherently political and um, inherently uh, depended upon recognizing the other as equal to oneself. And so then this whole um, new way of, of manifesting the human condition actually comes up in our history quite late in life. And the Greeks then, when they got to this place, started to self-reflect. And then there's a lot of conversation around, around this. Obviously, in the early Greek uh, polis, the men, the slaves and the women who were laborers were um, not quite as impressive 
as the free people who were men of action and speech and governance and ideas. Um, and um, and in, in between were the artists and the artisans and the merchants. And actually the men of action, the free men of, that spent their leisure time in the world of ideas and governance and action, actually looked down upon the merchant class because they couldn't understand why they would um, uh, occupy themselves with these great works of genius because in that sense they saw them as more like being laborers, that they were still tied to the physical or material world. So these are the three, the tripart division of the human condition. And so in 2009 I asked myself, what, what, how do these translate into the sum total of human action? If we could just look at all the labor as one dynamic system, and all the work as another dynamic system across all of human species, and action as another dynamic system within the whole species, what would we see? And to make a long story short, because I wrote a long, torturous document explaining this translation and why it works, we could map individual labor, the part of the human condition, as economies. And so this was very, very clear to Marx that, the, that homo laborans was the driver of the great economic systems throughout all of, of humans. And, um, you know, this is true for whether it's a capitalist system or a socialist system. It's where um, in the free economy, we just see an hour's worth of labor, an hour's worth of labor. That we look at them, everyone as an independent agent, this kind of common quantifiable soup of driving force. And that the collective sphere of work as a human condition were all our great technologies. And certainly, technology has gotten so advanced that we only, you know, we pretty much um, enact technology, the technological realm, in a collaborative way. So unlike just the laborers who drive the economy, um, there are the Steve Jobs of the world who are in this category and creating great impetus for technological innovation. And we've seen that this has become a, a much more uh, collective um, pursuit than it used to be. It used to be the, you know, the single Michelangelo's and Leonardo da Vinci's, and now our technological projects are quite large. And so unlike in the economy, we just want someone to show up as one man, one dollar, one hour, um, and just look at it quantifiable. In technology, we want people to show up as with skills. We suffer the idiosyncrasies of great genius. We do not want to level the playing field. We want novelty and genius. And so we see that both of these have become great systems, great economic systems and great technological systems. And finally, in the realm of the polis, of action, of speech acts, I call that collectively geosocial space. Because the way, the key feature of this is being able to show up as a unique individual with unique rights, with unique recognition, you know, and you, can, you show up as other and you represent your otherness in the marketplace of ideas. And I call it geosocial space because in many cases, you know, it started with, we primarily identify with geographic type identities, um, even if they're nation state, they're pretty much geographically identified. But more increasingly, um, these spaces of identities are social spaces so that, um, and we see the collective uh, explosion of geosocial space also over time. So we have many more identities than we, we used to have um, in terms of um, not necessarily nation states, states but um, in terms of um, affiliations and categories and gender categories and alma maters and however, and our friends on, on, on Facebook and Gamebee, for example, is a emergent geosocial space. So the idea that we see an explosion of geosocial space in, in different ways. 
Now the interesting thing about economies is that the overall trajectory of an economy is toward a conservation of resources in a hierarchical way so that we have more, fewer and fewer winners over time. This is true whether it's a communist, bureaucratic state, or an authoritarian state. Uh, whatever, what we call economies is the human drive to build these larger and larger aggregate or, or accumulative type of connections. Um, and so it is not... Um, Surprising then that the um, that labor as a human condition has moved into a global economy. It, it is the end result of this type of impel, impulse in the human condition. Whereas geosocial spaces tend to distribute novelty, so there's more and more identities going on over time. Now. What, what's interesting is when, um, for example, in the past, when there was a lot of tribal identities, when, a, when statism or nationism comes through, and under an economic policy glo you know, uh, connects these, then what you see initially is a loss of identity. And you start having, for example, the, these tribal identities coming into... Um, a single geosocial spatial identity of nation, nationhood, and that always comes in with a monetary policy. So that the, the thrust of an economic impulse is this, this hierarchical, synthesizing, um, totalizing um, control of human activity, and the impulse of geosocial space is the impulse for individuation and, and more and more unique um, and uh, um, identity showing up more and more unique and having your your uniqueness show up in in geosocial space. So we see the post USSR um, dissolution into many nation states as the opening of geosocial space and the current moves of the EU to uh, create a single monetary currency as the closing of geosocial space and the increasing of the economic impulse. These are the way these dynamics work. And technology is the increasing um, variation of forms in order to express these things. It's novelty, it's invention, it's innovation um, into the physical world. So they... they they enable either economic, the impulse of the economy to get um, more accumulative. They also enable the opening of geosocial space. So technologies are kind of like drivers of both, both of these impulses. So we can see the relative um, effect that these have, we can t I turn them into units of human action. So there are G units, there's E units, and there's T units. And so, for example, certain uh, decisions can increase G units, and certain decisions can increase E units, and certain decisions can increase T units, and I started to see them as a natural relation, so that when one moved, the others would have to move in this way, and there's some kind of natural antagonism between um, uh, E and G units, and there is a feed-forward aspect to T units. And then one other thing I did with playing with this is that <clears throat> I looked at different societies based upon the um, research that Don Beck and uh, the human emergence people did. And they have a whole theory of why the different cultures are manifest the way they do, and it's a developmental theory. And my um, impression is, is that these are not developmentally driven, but they're, they're conditioned by these three different impulses in the human condition. So that, for example, we can plot out just as a metaphor, really, um, the G units and the E units and the T units in three-dimensional space, 
and we can imagine societies, let's say like an Arab nation that has a very highly um, unified economy, not a lot of um, novelty in geosocial space, and relies only on a small type of technology. Um, and that would be the shape of that society. And, that, and a society that I would say Game B is looking for would have a lot of potential for identifying and re-identifying and making up new identities. A distributed economy, so it's not so totalized and capturable, but to some extent would, would probably need to be. And then a increase, that all driven by an increase in technological innovation. So we call this the shape of human action, and it can map on to all the different cultural types in um, the examples of the human emergence, the stratification of human democracy. And my <clears throat> theory is, is that every society is, is faced with historical conditions and that they are responding to those conditions by um, sometimes having a uh, coup or have a revolution that increases the G units and that might create some more technology. And then there's periods where that creates the accumulation of wealth which maybe creates a more powerful state that reduces the G units. And this, this shape is always kind of pulling and pushing on each other. And that the sum total of human action is the accommodation of cultures. For example, this culture that has this shape is also under adaptive pressure from the other cultures. And so that, that what, how they accommodate these three impulses of dynamics of the human collective human condition are also part of the complete adaptation of um, all humans now that we're interconnected. So one of the things that is also interesting about this is that just from the way the culture of the society feels under certain conditions, whenever there's fewer and in general, whenever there's fewer identities, right, so everybody is more like you, that you have to work with, and larger economic systems, so that, you know, there's, there's a natural hierarchy and you depend upon the, um, the banks are healthy, so the mortgage system is healthy, and everything is, is kind of pushed toward this direction so that there's stability and a lot of resources built up hierarchically and that the technology is somehow um, pacing itself. Then those are times when the civilization feels more robust. It makes more sense. We, f we feel that things are right, they're on target. This is like the typical 50s and 60s. The, that generation growing up. There wasn't a lot of activity in geosocial space. The economy was accumulating resources in a hierarchical way, the trickle-up kind of economy. Um, the technology wasn't moving too fast. That, that felt very sane. And when things move this way, when the predominant direct trajectory is this way toward a lot of change in technology, a lot that's technologically disrupted, a lot of new identities like we have today, um, being corporations have identities, there's many more gender identities, marriage identities, subsystems, groups, um, a lot of different clashes of ethnics, ethnicity and culture, and those cultures are all hybrids of other cultures. Well, this feels less robust and more chaotic. But actually, this is when the system is becoming more resilient because there's resilience in this type of trajectory. And even though this feels more robust, this is when, when, when the trajectory is in this direction, the economy is ready for a collapse, the, um, a, the suppressed identities are ready to explode, and the technological, technological um, uh, imagination is uh, just ready to um, exploit the situation. 
So whether the technology then exploits the economy or the, the new identities creates the technology, you know, this is an autopoetic system. So this is the first thing you need to understand in the sense where I think panarchy theory can come into um, the conversation of game B. So I just want to um, go to the second slide and I will post on, I will post with this on game B um, some text about what these three units and what it, what it feels like to be in the situations of increasing G units or increasing E units or increasing T units. So that's the first section. So I sat while I was writing that uh, what we were just talking about. I, I started to do more research, and I came across a book by Buzz Hollings. And Buzz Hollings um, tells the story. He was a biologist, and he was working on homo organ the homostasis of organisms, the mechanisms by which organisms stay homostatic, stay in balance. And he was trying to move that concept into ecology because he was a, 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 an ecologist. And that's where his research was in ecology. And he found out that when you move the concept of homostasis to ecological systems, it didn't work. And in fact, homostasis, homeostasis in an ecology was certain death. So he became very interested in this. And after many, many years of research, he came up with... Um, what is actually happening in ec ecological systems is much more vibrant. And he called it the panarchy cycle. So it's something similar to chaotic systems. Um, and so he said in basically what happens in, in ec ecologies or ecological systems is there's four major phases. And a healthy ecology has to go through these phases, phases as a, at a certain you know, turn over a certain number at a certain pace in order to stay healthy. And so he, for example, we all know this, that the early uh, ec management theory of ecology actually destroyed a lot of ecologies because they were trying to optimize for some kind of homeostatic um, condition. So he said there were four types of um, drivers in this panarchy cycle. And I'm going to tell this story because it's easier to understand in terms of what's called island biogeography. You know, people have studied where either new islands have come up uh, as just empty, you know, naked larva, um, lava, rocks, and then become established ecology, ecological communities over time. And they also studied this when, like, the, the uh, Mount St. Helens uh, erupted and pretty much laid just a, the ecology back to a much more simple area, and they noticed that these go through this, you know, notice that the evolution of an ecology goes through that. But this can happen. They've also seen this happening over deep evolutionary time and in all kinds of ecosystems. So this is what happens. The, after Mount St. Helens destroys everything, the first thing that happens is a reorganization. So this is called the alpha uh, phase, where um, the conditions in the, in the locale start to reorganize. Um, some plants move out, some plants move in, some worms move out, some worms move in, some, some animals have died out, some other animals have moved in, and sometimes there's speciation happening here. So 
This is reorganization. Things are not well connected because, um, you know, if it's an island that has erupted out of the ocean, then there's a rat that, you know, a couple of rats that have come off a ship or a couple of um, pelicans ended up living there. You know, so they're not, there's a lot of space, there's not a lot of interconnection, and the situation is becoming reorganized. And then it comes down to this phase of exploitation. So once a species gets a foothold, then it starts to really uh, be successful and exploit its niche. And this starts to put pressure on um, those species that are just barely um, managing. So some, some of the species, some of these new emergent um, um, habitat inhabitants will start to exploit more and more niches. And um, this will means that some of the inhabitants leave or die off, but it also produces pressure to um, speciate. And when it speciates, then you have new types new, that reorganize and exploit different niches. But eventually, what happens is that the new emergence of new species or new types um, becomes uh, crowded out, and the types of niches that can be exploited become reduced, and you have start to get a dominant ecology. So you might have, have uh, like the old chestnut forests in New England, um, there were not a lot of species. There was just kind of a dominant ecology where all the biomass, all the energy gets stored in fewer and fewer forms, fewer and fewer types of um, activity, and but there's a lot of potential stored in there. So this is this is like the economy getting um, to to be reliant on you know one monetary system and a few big bankers. This is the one percent growing up here. So this is the level of case strategies or conservation. Now the thing about this um, phase is that. If it, if it grows too large, if it doesn't turn over fast enough, and we'll get to why that happens, then there can be an overshoot, and there's a landscape fitness thing happening. So if it overshoots, it can never come around and regenerate itself. It, the, the ecology just completely fail, fails. And this was the crisis of ecological management when Buzz Hollings was doing his research, because our interventions were all case strategies, conservation strategies, conserve what, what, it, what is, conserve the forests in California, conserve wetlands, conserve the farmlands. And what happened is that created an overshoot in the ecology in this conservation phase in which those systems completely collapsed. Because what Hollings realized is a healthy ecosystem had this other, it's called the backside of the canopy cycle, called the omega cycle, which is the, is the release cycle, where this phase of, of conserving more and more of your resource potential energy and kinetic energy in fewer and fewer forms gets decomposed by, you know, fire in the forest or uh, periodic insect infestation, um, wetlands drying up, beavers moving on, so that this part that we, that management, ecological management, was seen as destructive was actually a necessary and creative aspect of a healthy ecology. And so that was called the release phase. And then after release, then you get new types of um, species, new types of identities, new um, um, participants coming in, new types of exploitation, and then it goes around and around and around. So, well, what I started to see is that the, what we were looking at before, the units of human action, actually could be mapped on this. Now, it gets a little confusing, because there are people that, you know, obviously the first thing you want to say, oh, that's, this is like our economy. You know, if, if it moves too far up into where there's only one monetary system and few and few people own any money, and without that being decomposed or released back into the system, redistributed, 
then you don't have a viable economy. So there are people working with the panarchy scale to try to revise the economy. But here is where that idea is limited. Because they're trying to revise the economy. But in the sum total of human action, economies are just case strategies. They want to revise the economy so that, that yes, they don't want the economy to crash, but the whole notion of economy is that people, you know, th this globalization of the monetary system, that it's hierarchical and conservative in, nat in nature. So people are using panarchy theory to fix the economy, or really only want to fix the economy so the economy can be more like in, the economy is over time, so that, that it can, it can uh, uh, can create more mutual in the interdependencies among larger and larger of people over time. So that, that and so that, what, what, what you can start to see if you understand this, that for a long, long, long time, the only decisions we make in our geo, uh, political, and our political economy are case strategies. So we move um, from, from, many different types of currencies. We moved from a time where, yes, there was intra, you know, there was debt accumulation, and then there was amnesty, so that the economy could recharge. So the amnesty aspect that, I know your um, debt forgiveness, this would be designing for a release phase in the economy. But over time, and it's, so, it's no surprise, we have a global economy, that all our collective decisions have, have, be, have become increasingly more case strategies. So case strategies are the economic impulse. The alpha strategy, the reorganization, is the opening of geosocial space. And the exploitation phase is what in human action is technology. So that we can see, and there, there's an interesting relationship in the other uh, slide, the relationship between K units, uh, uh, G units, E units, and T units, or in this case, K strategies, alpha strategies, and R strategies, is that, that this overshoot, the ability for this to grow, seems to be... be Increased by moving the dynamic here, so that that you if and we see this in late stage neoliberal capitalism. Yes, that creates more and more of a global unification of monetary systems, but it's also being supported by the ability for geosocial space to be opened up and new technologies to happen. But there's a kind of a delicate balance because if there's an overshoot here, then the, then the system will collapse. So what we see, if we can overlay the units of human action, we see that moving in this direction, anything that moves in this cycle creates more resilience. Anything that moves in this cycle, case strategies are always about creating this sense of safety or robustness, although we all know that there's a folly in that now. But the question is, so now this is where this model can ask interesting questions of game B. And, and the question is this. So we know how to design for geosocial space, distrib you know, more distributed identities, more fluidity and flexibility in the um, social sphere, um, more conversations, more connect, you know, more distributed networking. Um, distributed networking is important because if it's not distributed networking and it's underneath a, you know, one um, company owns all the distribution channels, then that is just increasing case strategies. And we know, you know, we're pretty good in game B about understanding technologies and how to exploit technologies. We understand the jeopardy of this monological um, focus on K strategies. But the question is, how do we design for 
know, can we and how do we design our society, our human condition for omega strategies? So we know this becomes resilient, this gives me robustness. And what, after I read Nicholas Taleb, I realized that this, that strategy is designing for anti-fragility. Now we're not talking about designing so that the economy could be anti-fragile, because that would be kind of a, you know, snookering ourselves, because we don't want to design anti-fragile systems that will only prejudice the conservation phase, the case strategies. We want to design for the sum total human action to be anti-fragile. So this is like the Greeks, you know, the Greeks understood that we labored. That was an early activity human condition. And then they understood that we had work and technology. That came next. And then they invented this geosocial space as part of the human condition. So the question is, what is the new domain of human action if human action is an ecological system or we want it to be or it's useful to think of it that way? What is the domain of human action that needs to be invented or discovered or created that designs human action for this release phase? Now, there are very interesting, that's a very interesting question. And it's, I can't say, it's answered. But, I, but I'm beginning to suspect, I mean, I'm still doing research, it has something to do with how we... Um, conceptualize the different type of social the different types of cues between what we consider our society and what we consider an ecology and I just give you a little sense of that I can't answer the question yet but for example for us you know so if we don't design for this release the planet is going to Designed for it eventually, you know, if we keep going, the planet will design for the release phase. And so it's going to take care of itself. But the question is, is how can we be sensitive and partner with that, that part of the dance, okay? So, and it, and it has to do with this, the, this conceptual limit. in my opinion, it has to do with this conceptual limitation we have between what we take as societal cues and what we take as an ecology. It's a figure ground problem in a metaphysical way. So, for example, when what we see in this release phase of things like climate change or the weather, that the planet is just doing something, we see it as an object, even if it has agency, it has the power to kill us, we see ecologies as the objective background against which we make decisions. So our labor, our geosocial space, and our technologies, we take social cues from that. We, we imagine that as subjective space. And what we set, use the term ecology for, we imagine as objective space. And so we take different types of cues from that. All right? And so some of the answer in this is moving beyond the dichotomy between the kinds of cues we take in social space as society from these three aspects of human action and the kinds of cues, engagements, or relationships we have what, with what we put in here as ecology. So what are our ecological partners versus our societal problems? And, and in that question, I believe is the answer to how to design with the ecological our ecological partners to truly participate with our ecological partners so that we are intentionally doing the backside of our dance. Because the backside of our dance, if this is right, is going to come anyways. But we want to do that, you know there was a term that Ray Dalio used a beautiful deleveraging. We want to have a beautiful releasing of the system. 
So we know some aspects of counteracting overshoot in the case strategy is more opening of geosocial space, more exploitation of technologies. But overall, even with that, the main thrust is still in basically to serve um, the K strategy. And so this is a coming down here and understanding how to design into or intentionally dance with this release phase, I think is a really interesting question for game B. And what I like about it is that we don't have to re-envision what an economy is. That can be part of our human condition. We just have to add a fourth term in the way that the Greeks actually invented the activity of geosocial space. We actively invent our participation with what we consider objective ecology in a way that solves this, this little puzzle here.